In the rugged terrain of ancient Carthage, a strategic genius emerges, forever etching his face into the nightmares of Roman children. His name was Hannibal Barca. War cries echoed through the Alps, signaling the audacious march of an enigmatic commander who dared to challenge the might of Rome. Come with me as we explore the life of Hannibal. Hannibal Barca, born 247 BC in present-day northern Tunisia, was one of the sons of Carthaginian leader Hamilcar Barca. Raised in the aftermath of Carthage's defeat in the First Punic War, Hannibal's family sought to improve their fortunes. Hamilcar, supported by Aegades, initiated the subjugation of tribes in the Iberian Peninsula. Facing logistical challenges, Hamilcar marched his forces across Numidia to reach the Pillars of Hercules and cross the Strait of Gibraltar. As a child, Hannibal expressed a strong desire to accompany his father in overseas wars. According to Polybius, Hamilcar agreed, but he demanded a solemn oath from Hannibal never to be a friend of Rome. There are different accounts of this oath with one version mentioning Hannibal being held over a sacrificial fire during the ceremony. Hannibal swore to use fire and steel to arrest the destiny of Rome. As soon as he reached the appropriate age, of course. We can't go having little eight-year-old Hannibal running after Rome with his cute little wooden sword. But I digress. This dramatic event, known as Hannibal's Oath, is said to have taken place in Peñascola, now part of the Valencian community in Spain. Spain, you might be thinking. Well, you see, Carthage had many territories up the northern coast of Africa, and around Spain on the Iberian Peninsula. They still had uh, overseas territories out of their main area of control. After his father's death in battle, Hannibal's brother-in-law, Hasdrubal the Fair, assumed command of the Carthaginian army in Hispania. Hannibal at the age of 18, served as an officer under Hasdrubal. Hasdrubal focused on consolidating Carthage's interests in Iberia, before forming diplomatic ties and signing a treaty with Rome that set boundaries along the Ebro River. What would Hannibal's father say about all this? one can only imagine. Following Hasdrubal's assassination in 221 BC, 26-year-old Hannibal was proclaimed commander-in-chief by the army and confirmed in official capacity by Carthage. The Roman scholar Livy portrayed Hannibal as reminiscent of his father Hamilcar, noting the resemblance in appearance and spirit. He exhibited the same qualities of leadership, facing opposition with skill while adeptly navigating between obedience and command. After consolidating his power, 
and completing the conquest of Hispania, Hannibal married a woman from Castulo, a powerful city allied with Carthage. She was likely named Imilke. No union was mentioned by Livy, while Silius Italicus suggested a Greek origin for Imilke. And please try not to giggle at the name Silius Italicus. It does not mean silly Italian. But, um, we can pretend it does. Now, another scholar, Gilbert Charles Picard, argued that she was not of Greek origin. Rather, she was of Punic origin. Punic is the term that we use to refer to Carthaginians, as that is how Rome was referring to them. In his initial campaigns, Hannibal attacked strongholds like Alithia and Helmantike, showcasing his tactical prowess. Upon returning home, a coalition of Spanish tribes led by the Carpetani, attacked, leading to Hannibal's first significant battlefield success at the Battle of the River Tagus. Fearing Hannibal's growing strength in Iberia, Rome formed an alliance with Saguntum, claiming it as a protectorate and breaching the treaty with Carthage. Hannibal planning an attack on Rome, saw the siege of Saguntum as a just cause for war, and used it as his casus belli. That's a war justification. The city fell after eight months, and Hannibal sent the booty to Carthage, gaining crucial support. You know, you become quite popular when you send back boatloads and boatloads of treasure, it really justifies the living away from home expenses that the people in charge are giving you. Now, of course, Rome was not too pleased with all this. In response, they dispatched a delegation led by Quintus Fabius Maximus Vericosus, to demand Carthage's stance on Hannibal's actions. The Carthaginian Senate, using legal arguments, questioned the validity of the alleged violated treaty. When asked to choose between war and peace, the Carthaginian audience replied that Rome could decide. Do you want to guess what they decided? I'm sure you decided to choose war, which is exactly what Quintus Fabius chose. So, if the Romans wanted war, the Carthaginians were going to bring it, and bring it hard. They did. And this is where Hannibal began to make preparations to cross the Alps. The plan to invade Italy was initially conceived by Hannibal's brother-in-law, Hasdrubal the Fair, who served as a Carthaginian general in the Iberian Peninsula. However, as you already know, he was assassinated in 221 BC, and Hannibal was the new guy in charge. The Romans, having dealt with the threat of a Gallo-Carthaginian invasion, were completely unaware of Hannibal's plans. Hannibal departed Cartagena, Spain, in the late spring of 218. But it wasn't easy. In fact, along the way, he faced challenges in subduing northern tribes and crossing the Pyrenees. 
despite releasing 11,000 Iberian troops at the Pyrenees, Hannibal's army still consisted of 40,000 foot soldiers, 12,000 horsemen, and 38 elephants. Upon reaching the Rhone in September 218 BC, Recognizing the obstacles ahead, including the Alps, and the Gauls who were not very happy to see him, Hannibal strategically navigated the challenges. Conciliating Gaulish chiefs and arriving at the Rhone before any Roman interference. His army, although diminished, comprised 38,000 infantry, 8,000 cavalry, and the elephants. Now, the elephants would become very important, but it is difficult to make an elephant walk up the daunting condition of a mountain. Well, that is exactly what Hannibal had to do. He skillfully outmaneuvered both natives and a Roman force to cross the Rhone Valley and advance towards the daunting Alpine crossing. The exact route he took over the Alps remains a subject of scholarly debate, with theories proposing different paths. There's really no way to know for sure, and perhaps one day we will find more solid archaeological evidence, as things are always left behind. Some modern theories suggest a march up the valley of Drôme, crossing the main range south of the Col de Montgevier. Others argue for a route farther north up the valleys of the Isère and Arc, crossing the main range near the present Col de Montsenis or Little St. Bernard Pass. Recent numismatic evidence indicates that Hannibal's army may have passed within the sight of a Matterhorn. Numismatic? That means the study of coins. They found money. Scholars, including geoarchaeologist Patrick Hunt, propose different routes, suggesting that the Col de Clapier is the most accurate based on ancient depictions of the route. Others argue in favour of the Col de la Traversette, supported by biostratigraphic archaeological data. The analysis of peat bogs near the watercourses on both sides of the pass's summit revealed disturbances by humans and animals. Radiocarbon dating secured dates of around 218 BC, aligning with Hannibal's march. Archaeologists contend that this, combined with other evidence, strongly supports the Col de la Traversette as the Hannibalic route. Polybius also mentioned the highest alpine pass, the Col de la Traversette, as Hannibal's likely crossing, reinforcing the case. In either way, it is certainly not as difficult as the route your parents took to school when they were your age. In summary, the debate continues, but recent evidence and interpretations lean towards the likelihood that Hannibal crossed the Alps through this path. Hannibal faced significant challenges during his alpine crossing, overcoming them with ingenious strategies, as Libby describes. For instance, he reportedly used vinegar and fire to navigate a rockfall. Now that shows some resourcefulness. While Polybius provides different figures suggesting Hannibal arrived in Italy with 20,000 foot soldiers, 4,000 horsemen, and only a few elephants, 
Livy's account includes details not mentioned by Polybius, leading to historical debates about the accuracy of troop numbers who he actually managed to guide over the Alps. But either way, when he got over there, there were many soldiers with him. Hannibal's military vision, shaped by Greek tutors and experiences with his father extended across much of the Hellenistic world. His grand strategy involved conquering Rome by opening a northern front and subduing allied city-states on the Italian peninsula, rather than a direct assault on Rome. The defeat of Carthage in the First Punic War influenced Hannibal's decision to invade Italy by land across the Alps. This ambitious plan required the mobilization of 60,000 to 100,000 troops, and bringing those elephants with you certainly needed some experts. Hannibal's audacious march into Roman territory shifted the battleground and disrupted the Roman strategy. His sudden appearance among the Gauls of the Po Valley allowed him to sway these tribes away from their Roman allegiance before Rome could even respond. Publius Cornelius Scipio the consul leading the Roman force to intercept Hannibal, was caught off guard, not anticipating an attempt to cross the Alps. Scipio, taken by surprise, attempted to intercept Hannibal, but was outmaneuvered. The Battle of Ticinus ensued, where Hannibal's superior cavalry forced the Romans to retreat. A little embarrassing for the Romans, for sure. Now, while this was a relatively minor victory, it managed to rally support from the Gauls and the Ligurians, boosting Hannibal's army to around 40,000 men. Scipio, severely injured, was rescued by his son, and the Romans retreated to Placentia. The Roman Senate was obviously in uproar about this. Responding swiftly, they ordered Consul Tiberius Longus to bring his army back from Sicily to reinforce Scipio. Hannibal, though, was pretty clever. I think you already know, and perhaps will know a little more about. He skillfully positioned himself to intercept Sempronius' captured Clastidium for supplies. Despite all of this, Sempronius managed to evade Hannibal's maneuvers, joining Scipio near the Trebia River. In December of the same year, Hannibal showcased his military brilliance, at the Battle of Trebia. After wearing down the superior Roman infantry, he executed a surprise attack and ambushed from the flanks, cutting the Roman forces to pieces. During the winter of 217 BC, Hannibal quartered his troops with the Gauls. However, their support was beginning to wane, and Hannibal became to get a little bit scared of assassination attempts. While he wasn't going to take any of these threats and perceived dangers lying down, so to counter this, he adopted a cunning strategy. You wouldn't believe it, he began to wear wigs. That's right, he began to wear wigs. And he was constantly changing the wigs 
to thwart his would-be assassins. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that extremely amusing. In the spring of 217 BC, Hannibal sought a more reliable base of operations, prompting him to move farther south. The Roman consuls Servilius and Flaminius anticipated Hannibal's advance on Rome and strategically blocked the eastern and western routes. The only viable alternative lay at the mouth of the Arno, a marshy area overflowing more than usual during the season. Despite the challenges, Hannibal's forces marched for four days and three nights through waterlogged terrain, crossing the Apennines and the seemingly impassable Arno. While successfully traversing these obstacles, a significant portion of his force was lost in the marshy lowlands. Arriving in Etruria, in the spring of 217 BC, Hannibal aimed to lure the main Roman army, led by Flaminus, into a pitched battle by devastating the region Flaminus was meant to protect. Despite these efforts, Flaminius remained encamped at Aretium. Hannibal executed a turning movement marching boldly around Flaminius's left flank, and caught him in a defile on the shore of Lake Trasimenus. There, Hannibal ambushed Flaminius's army, destroying it in the waters or on the slopes, marking one of the most costly ambushes in Roman history. With Flaminius defeated, Hannibal recognized the impossibility of directly attacking Rome without siege engines. Instead, he opted to exploit his victory by entering central and southern Italy, encouraging a general revolt against Roman rule. Now, just quickly, this is quite early in the history of the Roman Republic, and at this time, Rome was quite different to Italy. There were many civil wars in Italy, and earlier Rome had just conquested many parts of it. Many people felt that Romans and Italians, or Etruscans as we can call them, were of a different culture. Of course, later on, people would become somewhat more accustomed to it. But if you ask Italians, even in our modern day, if Romans are the same as people from other cities, I'm sure they could tell you a few differences. So, the Romans were obviously not very impressed by this and they were having rather a rough time of it. In response to Hannibal's victories, the Romans appointed Quintus Fabius Maximus Viricosus as their dictator. Dictator meaning someone who has absolute power to make all the decisions. It wasn't such of a dirty word back in the ancient times. Departing from conventional Roman military tactics, Fabius adopted a defensive strategy that came to be named after him. Instead of engaging Hannibal in open battle, he positioned several Roman armies in Hannibal's vicinity to observe and limit his movements. Many dirty tricks and guerrilla warfare, that was what Fabius was all about. Hannibal, unable to draw Fabius into a proper battle between gentlemen, ravaged Apulia, and then marched through Samnian to Campania, 
hoping to force Fabius into action through devastation. However, Fabius closely followed Hannibal's destructive path while maintaining a defensive stance. This strategy, deemed cautious by Fabius, was criticized by many Romans who viewed it as a form of cowardice. As winter approached, Hannibal found himself trapped in the devastated lowlands of Campania, as Fabius had blocked all the exit passes. This situation led to the night battle of Agar Falernus. Hannibal devised a cunning plan. By tying burning torches to the horns of cattle and driving them up nearby heights, tricking some Romans into pursuing what they believed to be the Carthaginian army. Seizing the opportunity, Hannibal quietly moved his entire army through an unguarded pass. Although Fabius within striking distance, his caution worked against him, and Hannibal successfully escaped, dealing a blow to Fabius's prestige and marking the end of Fabius's dictatorial power. No one was going to be taking him seriously after that. In the spring of 216 BC, Hannibal strategically seized the supply depot at Cannae, placing himself between the Romans and their crucial supply sources. The Romans, under consuls Gaius Terentius Varro and Lucius Aemilius Paulus, raised an unprecedentedly large army to confront Hannibal. Estimates range from 50 to 80,000, with some even suggesting even 100,000. That's a lot of guys. They really wanted to wipe Hannibal out. The Romans marched southward to Apulia and found Hannibal encamped on the left bank of the Orphitus River. The two councils alternated command daily with Varro leading on the day of battle. Hannibal capitalized on the Romans' eagerness, using an envelopment tactic to draw them into a trap. The Carthaginian general strategically placed his least reliable infantry in the center, luring the Romans in. Meanwhile, his cavalry on the flanks dealt with their Roman counterparts rendering the Roman numerical advantage completely ineffective. Although the Roman legions initially forced their way through Hannibal's centre, the Libyan mercenaries on the wings swung round, menacing the flanks. Hannibal's cavalry, led by the reliable Marbal and Hanno, proved unbeatable shattering the Roman cavalry and attacking the legions from behind. This resulted in the Roman army being hemmed in with no means of escape. Of course, the Romans were very panicked about this and got completely massacred. The Battle of Cannae became one of the most famous tactical masterpieces in military history showcasing Hannibal's strategic brilliance and decisiveness. Hannibal's brilliant tactics at the Battle of Cannae resulted in the near destruction of the Roman army, with estimates of 50 to 70,000 Romans killed or captured. Among the casualties were the consul Lucius Amelius Paulus, two consuls from the preceding year, two quaestors, twenty-nine of the forty-eight military tribunes, and an additional eighty senators, constituting a significant loss for the Roman Senate. The devastating defeat 
led to Roman hesitation in confronting Hannibal in pitched battles, with a preference for attrition to weaken him. The Romans relied on their advantages of interior lines of supply and manpower. Hannibal, despite his triumph, faced challenges such as a lack of commitment from Carthage in terms of men, money, and siege equipment. Consequently, he did not bring the war directly to Rome. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. If the mood within the Carthaginian Senate had have been a little different, some more support for Hannibal, and they had said to themselves, you know what, let's wipe out Rome once and for all, they probably could have done it. And our world would have looked very different. Well, maybe the alternate history is for another channel to deal with. Marhabal's famous remark, Hannibal, you know how to gain a victory, but not how to use one, underscores the missed opportunity to capitalize on the triumph at Cannae. Despite gaining support in many parts of Italy and inducing revolts in Sicily and Macedonia, Hannibal could not receive the necessary reinforcements for a direct assault on the capital of Rome. Instead, he focused on subduing fortresses and securing alliances, notably with the newly appointed tyrant Aeronymus of Syracuse, and the defection of certain Italian territories, including Capua, which became Hannibal's new base. However, only a few Italian city-states defected to him. This fell very short of his expectations. The war in Italy entered a strategic stalemate, as the Romans, influenced by Fabius' strategy of attrition, deprived Hannibal of large-scale battles, and instead gauge, engaged him in multiple smaller campaigns to weaken him. Fabius, nicknamed the Delayer, avoided open confrontation, and just continued to wear Hannibal down, little by little. Hannibal was not going to take this lying down, and he certainly didn't. He resorted to a scorched earth policy, and struggled with limited support from Carthage and its new ally, Philip V of Macedon. Despite some victories, Hannibal faced challenges, losing ground due to inadequate backing from Italian allies, abandonment by Carthage, and an inability to match Rome's vast resources. Carthaginian political dynamics played a crucial role, with power concentrated in the oligarchy, including the Council of Thirty Nobles and the Hundred and Four. Two factions, the war party led by the Barkids, Hannibal's family, and the peace party led by Hanno II the Great operated in Carthage on equal footing. Hanno, instrumental in denying Hannibal reinforcements after Cannae, represented the peace party. Hannibal started the war without full support from the Carthaginian oligarchy, which controlled its strategic resources. Despite Hannibal's constant requests for reinforcements, the oligarchy prioritized reinforcing and supplying Iberia over supporting Hannibal directly. Hannibal faced challenges as he struggled with less trained mercenaries and the oligarchy's commercial interests. 
In March of 212, Hannibal captured Tarentum in a surprise attack. But despite this, Rome's tide was turning against him. The battle is turning in our favour. You must comment if you know the reference. The Roman consuls sieged Capua in 212 BC, prompting Hannibal to attack and force their withdrawal. He then moved to Lucania, defeating a Roman army at the Battle of Silarus, and another at the First Battle of Herdonia. In 211 BC, Rome successfully sieged Capua. Hannibal attempted to lift the siege, but he failed, marching on Rome to draw off Roman soldiers. Despite some tactical victories in Apulia, Hannibal's hold on South Italy began to weaken with the loss of Tarentum in 209. In 207, he aimed for a combined march on Rome with his brother Hasdrubal, but retired to Calabria upon hearing of Hasdrubal's defeat and the death and his death rather in the Battle of Metaurus. The events marked the end of Hannibal's success in Italy. With the decline of Carthage's fortunes and the failure of his brother Margo in Liguria, Hannibal's hope of recovering ascendancy in Italy had vanished. In 203, after almost fifteen years of fighting in Italy, he was recalled to Carthage to defend against a Roman invasion under Scipio Africanus. In 203 BC, Hannibal was recalled to Carthage from Italy by the war party. After leaving a record of his expedition in the temple of Juno Lacinta in Crotona, he sailed back to Africa. His return boosted the war party's influence, and he took command of a combined force of African levies and Italian mercenaries. In 202 BC, Hannibal engaged in a fruitless peace conference with Scipio, despite their mutual admiration. Negotiations failed due to Roman allegations of Punic faith, citing breaches of protocols in the First Punic War. A peace plan was worked out, but was rejected by Carthage. The decisive Battle of Zama followed, resulting in Hannibal's defeat and the removal of his aura of invincibility. At the Battle of Zama, a pivotal engagement in the Second Punic War, the Romans held superiority in cavalry, thanks to the betrayal of Massinissa, a former Carthaginian ally who changed sides. Despite Hannibal's mental exhaustion and deteriorating health, the Carthaginians had an infantry advantage, and not to mention eighty war elephants. We are in Africa after all. The Roman cavalry though swiftly routed the Carthaginian cavalry, and effectively countered the war elephants by playing trumpets to frighten them. And frightened they were as they stampeded away. The battle remained closely fought, and at one point Hannibal seemed on the verge of victory. Scipio, though, rallied his men, and a two-pronged attack by the Romans caused the Carthaginian formation to collapse. With their general defeated, the Carthaginians surrendered losing approximately 20,000 troops and 15,000 wounded. In contrast, the Romans suffered a mere 2,500 casualties. 
The Battle of Zama therefore marked the end of Hannibal's military career and Carthage's ability to challenge Rome for Mediterranean supremacy. After the Second Punic War, Hannibal became a statesman and was elected Sufet in Carthage. He initiated financial reforms to eliminate corruption and recovered embezzled funds. This diminished the power of the oligarchs. Suspected of conspiring against Rome, Hannibal fled into voluntary exile to avoid Roman demands for his surrender. He journeyed to Tyre, Antioch, and Ephesus, where he advised Antiochus III and attended a lecture by Formio. Tensions rose between Seleucids and Rome, and Hannibal proposed an anti-Roman coup in Carthage. This coup, however, did not materialize. Sometime later, in 190, after defeats in the Roman Seleucid War, Antiochus gave Hannibal a military command. He built a fleet, but suffered defeat in the Battle of Side and the Battle of Myonessus, leading to a decisive Roman Pergamene victory in the Battle of Magnesia. The truce signed at Sardes in 189 BC forced Antiochus to surrender Hannibal to Rome. He briefly sought refuge in the Armenian royal court, then fled to Crete and returned to Anatolia, where he served Prusias I of Bithynia in warfare against Rome's ally, Eumenes II of Pergamon. The circumstances surrounding Hannibal's death are uncertain. Pausanias mentioned a wound on Hannibal's finger caused by his drawn sword while mounting his horse, leading to a fatal fever three days later. Other sources, like Livy and Cornelius Nepos, present a different account, suggesting that Flaminius demanded Hannibal's surrender from King Prusias, prompting Hannibal to take poison upon realizing escape was possible. Impossible, rather. Apian proposed that Prusias poisoned Hannibal himself. Could be. Whichever way it happened, Hannibal's tomb was said to be at Libisa, on the sea of the Marmara coast. Although some believe it was at Gebze, while others place it even further west of this. His date is of death is variously dated between 183 and 181. Perhaps we can settle on 182 and be done with the issue. Dear listeners, we've reached the end of today's video about Hannibal Barker and what a man he was. Certainly a nightmare for the Romans. I've been your host today, the ASMR Historian. Thank you dearly for joining me in today's video, it's been a pleasure. If you like the content, make sure that you subscribe and perhaps leave your comments down below. Always appreciate it. But for now, I'm going to wish you good night. I'll see you next time.